running out because they have exams to go to immediately afterwards. Uh, welcome. I'm Marta Kudus, the chair of this department, and I've been with it since its beginning, and I uh, continue to have the same excitement that I did, uh, I don't even know how many years ago, in 1988. days are always, I mean, much more emotional for you probably than for me, but only slightly less emotional for me. I know that this is a very special weekend um, for everybody, um, and I'm going to start by saying that I have a great pleasure of uh, working with, um, I'll say it with kids, but the young, young men and women, and with the students. And to put this into perspective, um, we're going to have approximately 250 uh, undergraduates graduating from cognitive science um, okay. this, in the next couple of days from the six colleges. And what you're going to get today is a sample of nine of them. Cream of the crop, nine of them who have gone through, uh, I don't know, you know, some people go through semesters, some people go through quarters. Quarters is hard. Getting information crammed into a brain in, over a period of, of uh, 10 weeks is just very difficult. I mean, they barely have time to breathe. And yet, not only have they breathed pretty well, but they've gotten to the point where they have a three-point uh, GPA overall. They have a 3.5 GPA in upper division courses. This is not easy. And the nine people here have done it. And They've also learned how to be cognitive scientists. They've learned how to solve problems, how to frame problems, how to take a problem and make it not a problem anymore. Uh, they've learned how to state what a problem is precisely enough so that they could actually do something to solve it, or at least to make headway, because it's difficult to solve things completely, because the world is constantly changing. They've picked up methods and procedures and, 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 and analyses that will allow them to navigate not only these problems, but other problems that they face in the world. Um, they've learned how to uh, work out their frustrations because not everything works the first time, or the second time, or the hundredth time, but they keep at it. They keep going for it. Um, I think that what you're going to see today, a lot of times, you know, especially, I mean, I, I get this as chair of cognitive science, but I'm sure as parents you do, like people ask you, well, what's your son do? studies cognitive science. And cognitive science. What is cognitive science? Well, what you're going to see today, that's cognitive science. And you're going to see the breadth of cognitive science. And it's going to be awesome. Awesome. I'm going to use it the show tomorrow. I normally write poems, and I didn't write a poem for today because, the, because what came to mind when I, when I thought about what's happening today is the sort of bittersweetness in it, and many of you just, you know, like, where are you going, my little one, my little one? Where are you going, my little one, my own? Turn around and you're two, turn around and you're four, turn around and you're a young girl or lad. One out of my door. We're losing them. You're sort of gaining them back, but you're, you're, you're also losing them. It's remarkable to me. I mean, I remember four or five years ago, people just, you know, and now they're leaving. I can't believe that this time is over. Today we're going to have the nine presentations. I actually want to, since some people will be leaving, I just want the, people, the ones of you that are here to stand up so that people can see. Uh, and I'm just going to read you quickly all of the titles uh, and, and the people that I want you to please to stand up. So for those of you who do have to go off the exam and stuff, uh, people will yes. Eric Altroff, Advisors, Virginia Desac, Online Cancer Factorization for Feature Selection in EG. Listen to these titles. These are mouthfuls. James McCluskey. Uh, advisor Virginia Desai, developing a novel multi-touch table approach using multi-view machine learning techniques. Matthew Hong, advisor Jim Holland, towards an informed selection of TUI metaphor, applying theory of contemporary metaphor for context for way of computing. Sophia Jimenez, Dr. Sarah Friel, the effect of vocabulary size and speaker identification. Rana Caprizi, Dr. Sarah Friel, examining preferences for in infants directed speech, non-human speech sounds, and music in infants with autism. David Singley, he's not David, not here yet. Jeremiah Palmerston, advisor Doug Mitz, 
mapping of soft motion information in the posterior parietal cortex of human behaving rats. Jennifer Wu, advisor Ben Bergen, spatial representation of sequential time in Mandarin English bilinguals. And Clarice uh, Robinault, advisor Ben Bergen, event memory and perception of agency in Spanish English bilinguals. Even if you didn't do anything for today, you deserve a great round of applause. I mean, but you're going to be giving us great presentations. by Doug Nitz, and he'll be talking to you about analysis of basal forebrain and parietal cortex neurons during the selective attention test. So without further ado, let's start with our first speaker, and that's Alric Alcock, Online Tensor Factorization for Future Selection of Hello, everybody. And also, you may notice that because this, this is such a loaded title, I'm going to be decomposing it uh, for you. First thing I'll be doing, and I'll be starting from the back uh, with EEG and just going over what that is. So, in in essence, and the most basic uh, in the most basic ways, uh, brain signals recorded on the scalp across the surface of the scalp uh, across um, several between 32 and 256 electrodes across the head, um, and at these sample rates, and this is what. Uh, on this child here, the EEG cap looks like, and these are the sam some samples of few of what the channels, the outputs of the channels look like. <coughs> so each of these channels, uh, each of the each of the signals that come off of these channels, is is a uh, collection of sine waves. Uh, it's uh, it's composed of multiple multiple frequencies happening at once, um, and this is a more of an illustration about how you can have a very complex seeming waveform uh, is actually composed of, of um, much more simple uh, waveforms. Um, these these waveforms, if you look at them uh, as a whole, give you a really decent indication of the state of the brain. Um, so you can see here in some some various different states, how different these waveforms are. You have very, going from very uh, slow, uh, low frequency um, in, in sleep and in the coma. And these are, of course, these are vastly different uh, states, right? So coma is very different from excited. Um, and you can tell just by eye uh, the difference uh, between these uh, states. So these, these signals originate uh, from groups of neurons um, and the electric fields generated by them firing in uh, synchrony. They, these signals are very faint because each individual neuron is the, the electric field is so small that you couldn't pick it up from outside the, the skull. Um, but as you have groups, larger groups of neurons firing together, you get stronger signals, and you can uh, the uh, you pick it up on the outside of the skull, but it's still very faint, and it's also it's also very muted by the by the layers of, of uh, the meninges and the, the skull and the skin. So, as we have seen, the there are multiple channels across the head. There, each of these channels has a signal that can be decomp decomposed into multiple simultaneous frequencies, and these things happen over time. So, this is this is a uh, this is a block shape as time evolves. Um, so you can, you can see here, if, as time continues, we get a new a new layer on this. The old layers in the front would fall away um, or, or fade away as, as time goes on. Um, so the basic idea and the reason the reason behind this um, behind doing this at all is that we'd like to take this information and be able to tell something about the state of the brain as a whole based on it. So there's a 
in general, there are a lot of these methods, and in general, a lot of these methods uh, are based on uh, on analysis of matrices. So, in in because of computational convenience, because of the the existence of a lot of tools to do um, matrix analysis, uh, a lot of research is done, and a lot of a lot of the actual methods that are used for uh, classification of uh, brain state is done on matrices. And what, in order to analyze a matrix, in when the data is actually like this, what you have to do is you have to say, well, I'm going to take a slice of this. And so you can see that this is a channel frequency slice. So this would be like one of these slices. Um, and you could also analyze a single channel at multiple, multiple frequencies over time, uh, but you then lose the, uh, the relationship between the channels um, in that context. And in this, when you're looking at this context, you're losing the relationship over time. So looking at tensors allows you, as, and doing analysis on the tensors as a whole, gives you um, the ability to see these interrelations. And so the, the basic, the reasoning here is that, is, is to answer a question, and it's a simple question, right? And there's a lot of data in this picture. But if I ask you this question, you wouldn't need all this data. And this is a matrix, right? And, but <coughs> this part is something you don't need in order to answer the question. And that's what we're trying to get the computer to do, is answer a question for us. And in, in this specific context that I'm looking at, it's whether someone's thinking about moving their left hand versus their right hand, or uh, specifically motor imagery. So the combination of these things, and the reason why this particular tensor decomposition I'm looking at uh, would work for this feature selection um, idea is because there's a lot of data <coughs> in these tensors. because if you, if you look at even a 10, 10 by 10 by 10 uh, tensor, you have a thousand data points in there. And so these tensors grow uh, in size very quickly when you're, when you're recording them, recording all the data and saving it and doing analysis on it. And so there's, there's, a, there's a good reason not to look through all of that every time you want to make uh, if you want to make a decision about it. What you'd like to do is you'd like to have a small indicator, like a smile on someone's face, that you can look at and say, oh, that's, that's the cue, that's, that's what I'm looking for. So in order to do that, the, the tensor decomposition methods take, a, uh, take this large amount of data and compress it down so that the, the energy of the tensor is stored in a much smaller uh, core uh, tensor, and the uh, the patterns of where these things came from is stored in these matrices, associated matrices that you get out as well. Um, and you can you can take a tensor like this with uh, 23 million data points, and using using you know only of them, you can represent 80% of the energy and the information you can reconstruct it again. So in the standard method of doing this, the standard methods for, for tensor analysis use iterative techniques that have criteria for stopping that may not necessarily be reached ever. And so you'd have, you'd have like some sort of max, uh, maximum number of iterations or um, in any case, it makes it unsuitable for things like doing it in real time. Uh, we're doing it uh, when, when you would like a result right off someone's head uh, rather than something that you recorded to a hard drive and are analyzing later. So that's, that's the idea behind the online part of this. Is the goal, the end, re end goal, is to take tensor algorithms and turn them into something that can run in real time or near real time. Um, so this, 
this is the end goal. This is the, the big idea, is to speed these things up uh, that usually take a long time, or considerably longer than um, you'd like them to take, and then apply them to EEG classification. So people, people who, what, what I've done is I've integrated the work of these, these authors. Um, so uh, Sun, Tao, and Paluta uh, uh, did pioneering work in the online methods. So they've, people have already looked at these online density compositions, but not necessarily for classification. Uh, uh, Fan and uh, uh, Jacoby did, um, they looked at the classification accuracy and improving classification accuracy after doing the uh, tensor decomposition. Then uh, Alco's group has looked at really fast ways to analyze matrices. So I've taken all these things and I kind of clumped them together and uh, then and, and made some assumptions. And, and the assumptions that allow me to, uh, to do what I'm doing are that because something, because when we're doing something in an online context, we can approximate, we can afford to approximate. Um, because new data is coming in, we can forget about the old data. Uh, as soon as the new data comes in, we don't necessarily need to have that long of a memory. And so even if we're wrong sometimes, as long as we're not that wrong, we're, we're fine. And so, uh, and of course, that features do exist features that are relevant to discriminating uh, between different brain states do exist in EEG, and this is borne out by uh, a, lot of, a lot of literature on uh, matrix, using matrix methods mostly. So the actual method that I'm, that I'm using uh, uses random protections, which uh, I will, so, so the basic sketch of this is we're trying to find patterns. And if you imagine a, a sandbox full of toys that are buried in the sand, and you're, you're trying to find the big patterns in the sandbox, and you push your hand into the sandbox randomly, in random places, you will, the bigger the object, the more likely it is that you're gonna hit it in a few tries. Does that make sense? Okay, so this idea means that you don't necessarily have to consider everything to pull out the major patterns that you're looking for. Um, and also that the standard iterative methods can be used in just, you can just do one pass. And you can see here a, a graph of, this is the standard, the classical method. Um, after, after a single iteration, it achieves about 75% of what it would achieve, um, or it achieves about 75% of the <laughs> of the fit. I, the the fit would be the goal. So your objective is to increase this fit um, over a few iterations. And you can see it levels out very quickly. So you can afford not to do these later iterations uh, if this is good enough, which is the approximation part. So the the next slide is uh, is kind of technical, but it's not it's not terribly so. It's more for people who are interested in exactly what I'm doing. So this this is exactly what I'm doing, um, <laughs> but it's not it's not entirely clear if if you don't if you're not familiar with a lot of these symbol the symbology. So the the basic explanation is not really necessarily relevant, but if there are questions about it. You refer back to this and I can point at things. So the, the end result is that doing the randomized the randomized method that I that I have put together versus the classical method. Um, this is this is kind of a squared uh, scale because I wanted you to see be able to see the the places where um, there there are a couple ways that uh, matrices can be accessed uh, or can be Major ways that they're uh, that they're stored on a computer, and the I wanted you to see the transition between um, where we're working in fast local memory on the on the processor close to the processor in here over to uh, 
slower memory. So you can you can see it just kind of dramatically pops up here. Um, but also that this starts going exponentially. The classical method increases in time exponentially while the uh, while the method that I uh, I developed with the randomization doesn't increase nearly so fast. And it's in seconds and as you can see it is tense. So the the next step in this is to take it to the next level with classification and incorporate that into the tensor decomposition method and allow you to um, to discriminate uh, more readily between the things that, that come out, the features that are pulled out should relate to <coughs> directly to the things that you're looking for, which there's there's a developments in that in that regard. So thank you. using this to classify motor imagery. Yes. Uh, and just, well, you know, imagining right versus left hand movement. I was just wondering, like, if, you know, if you'd actually given that a shot yet, what, you know, how it works. The, the classification, uh, I've actually, I have given it a shot, and I've done some, I've done some stuff. And done, uh, the stuff that I'm working on right now gives me around 80% accuracy, but I'm shooting for better. So I think I can do better than that. Um, but, yes. I've tried it, give it a shot, not in real time yet. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that I would need to to get this on a in a system that's you know more more expensive, I guess, than MATLAB. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> will it, will it, does the discrimination depend on the left side versus the right side or oh whether you whether you look at one versus the other in terms of the power. As far as you know right now, anyways. Yeah. It's if if I had to choose two channels, uh -huh. uh, I would choose the ones that were the motor, motor protests. And uh, compare the left one versus the left. 